You know, the truth is that as long as there have been people, there have been public relations. Uh, it may not have been called that. It may have taken on different forms. But since people, you know, have existed, somebody's been trying to convince someone of someone else or make a connection with somebody else on behalf of a, themselves or an organization or whatever. And so since the, the dawn of time, there's really been public relations in some form or another. And of course, that's evolved over over time, just as people have evolved over time. We've moved from you know, press agentry into different forms of public relations. But so we're going to kind of fast forward and limit our discussion of um, the history of public relations to the modern history of public relations, what we would call a modern history of public relations. We don't have time to cover public relations since the beginning of time. So we're going to focus just on what we would define as the modern history, starting in about the 1800s. And so um, with that in mind, we're just going to progress through the, the couple of different stages here of public relations in the modern history. So the first kind of stage that we're going to look at is from the 1800s. And this part of the timeline we, we kind of refer to as press agentry. The, the primary focus of public relations during this time was just kind of publicity and press agentry. And so, um, so when we think about press, press agentry, we think about hype tactics and publicity stunts. It was all about kind of shock value and what can you do to, to make a scene to kind of draw people in out of curiosity or because you're, you're putting on this huge event or something like that. And it was really just about hype tactics and publicity stunts during that time. So we think about people during that time, one of the first people to really use public relations for that purpose to drive, um, to drive their organization, to drive their purpose um, was, was PT Barnum. You're probably most familiar with P.T. Barnum from the Barnum and Bailey Circus. Of course, he was part of that. You may have seen seen a, a version of his story in The Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman and things. But um, P.T. Barnum was this was this fellow who basically had some ideas and he wanted to draw people in and he needed things that, uh, that he thought would draw people in. And so he, he created shock value. He created these events. He said, come see the bearded lady. Come see the the uh, the smallest man on earth to, to ever live. You know, this guy that he would bring in. So he, he put on all these kind of publicity stunts that drew people in and, and drove curiosity about what they were doing. And, and then he leveraged that into uh, greater notoriety for his organization or whatever. And so, um, you know, he was, he was a press agent. He was his own best press agent. You know, he, he basically said one time, there's no such thing as bad press. Any press is good press in essence. Right. So, um, PT Barnum was one of the first real public relations practitioners of that time to use that sort of press agentry to his advantage. We also saw it in the work of the railroads and what we would call westward migration, kind of opening up the United States during that time, during the early and mid 1800s, to get people to, to basically move out west to say, hey, there are things that exist west of Ohio and west of Pennsylvania and, and not on the east coast. The west was pretty sparsely populated. It was sort of a, you know, kind of a no man's land, kind of a free for all out there. And they really wanted to popularize it so that people would would uh, would develop communities there. And and that that served the railroads, of course, because then they would be able to transport people and transport goods and and things. They had, they'd spent all this time and money developing railroads for westward um, use. And so now they need the people out there so they can justify having them and and, and create some business out there. So they, they created this kind of press um, uh, effort if you will, this public relations effort focused on, on press things about talking about how great it was out West and, and offering travel and different things like offering contests and, and things. So the railroads really had a lot of success pushing westward migration again for their own purposes, for their own, they had a goal there, they had an objective, but, but they used in many ways, what we would call public relations, albeit specifically press agentry type public relations to accomplish that goal though, but to, to demonstrate what was possible. They really, really demonstrated for a lot of organizations what was possible using those types of tactics and strategies. We also did see though, some, some people really embrace public relations for a sense of social responsibility. We're thinking here about people like John Muir. John Muir was a, a, an environmentalist and did a lot of writing and and things about how the, the wonder of nature. Um, you may be familiar with this famous quote, the mountains are calling and I must go. That's one of his from a letter that he wrote to his sister, I believe that. Uh, um, so but John Muir used public relations to, to to share with people the wonder of the natural beauty of the United States and, and the need for preservation and the opportunities there. So he's public relations for social responsibility in that way. 
We also saw that through uh, famously through Ida Wells. Ida B. Wells was a famous practitioner of public relations at that time in terms of using public relations to um, to share her message about social responsibility and about not only women's rights, but uh, um, the rights of minorities and, and people like that. So um, using press agency and public relations during that time to start that, you know, the, that nugget of social responsibility that we see continue and expand today, as we will discuss, but really got its roots then in that early era, in that 1800s era of public relations. So lots of things happen in there, but mainly a focus on press agentry during that period of time. But when we move to the next part of the timeline here in modern public relations, in the early 1900s through the mid 1900s through about, you know, through the 1950s and, and uh, up to the 1960s or so. But, you know, we see the what we would call the modern pioneers of our current, you know, definition of public relations. People really starting to practice what we might identify as as more full public relations, a more full form of that. So some of the modern pioneers that we think about during that era include somebody like Ivy Lee. Ivy Lee was a very famous practitioner of public relations and really established on a lot of the sort of guidelines of modern day public relations. He, he really professionalized the public relations role in terms, especially in terms of, of a public relations counsel. He had his own firm, but he provided counsel to a lot of organizations about how they could handle their public relations more effectively. Their specifically, you know, their relationships with the publics that they serve and that they that they wanted to uh, to to pull in and to have be a part of their organization. He really professionalized that role, uh, gave it value at the executive level in many ways, in terms of people recognizing that this is valuable counsel. This is not just, you know, people who print up flyers and, and come up with crazy ideas for publicity stunts and things. These can be people, these public relations people can can offer a lot of really good input for how we can grow and, and achieve our goals as an organization. So he really demonstrated that a professionalized public relations practitioner can really add a lot of value at that executive level. And he did start to emphasize that sort of two way communication of public relations, that it wasn't just a one way let me get this out there so you have it, but it's really understanding who your publics are and and uh, and trying to achieve your purposes through that and reaching those specific people and and developing relationships was another big part of his um, work in terms of uh, the the early pioneering of public relations, developing relationships with key figures in those publics with influence influencers or influential people within those publics and, and really establishing that two way emphasis. So I really one of the giants in the development of modern public relations. Another is a gentleman named Edward Bernays, Edward Bernays, who was actually a nephew of Sigmund Freud. And uh, so may not surprise you that to find out that he really put an emphasis on scientific persuasion on social science and psychological behavior and, and that type of thing. And he brought that to the, the practice of public relations, the scientific methods of persuasion through study, through research, specifically through identifying a target audience, understanding who is it that we're reaching. We're not going to try and reach everybody in the world with this message or with this campaign. Who are we trying to reach and how can we best tailor our message to that group by doing research, by conducting research and by understanding who that audience is, both not just their, their habits, but their psychology and their, and those types of makeups, right? So we do research into those people. We tailor a message specifically to that target audience. That was a major contribution of Edward Bernays. People were not doing it before that. Really. He's the one who can kind of formalize that professionalize that and demonstrated the value that can come with that type of approach to public relations. So again, Edward Bernays, another giant in terms of uh, public relations uh, modernization. Uh, and finally, in this, or not finally in this level, but we want to talk about Arthur Page as well. Arthur Page, um, who uh, was, uh, you know, worked in media, worked in, in publishing really, but was contacted and eventually ended up becoming a major figure in public relations mostly for the stands that he took when, when people would approach him, he would turn down clients and things because he didn't like their approach or he didn't like what they stood for. He really felt as though your reputation as an organization is earned through action. So, you know, kind of that old saying, action speak louder than words, right? He felt the same about companies and organizations that your reputation is going to be earned through your actions. And if your actions, if you're not willing to line those up, if your activity and your actions are not going to line up with what you say you want, then I really don't have anything to do to help you. Right? That's, that was his philosophy. 
He also then, again, kind of like Ivy Lee, really um, established public relations as a management function, as, as something that should be involved at the highest executive levels, uh, and not just something that you... You send a message down and tell people, this is what I want you to do. It's not just a directive type thing, but these are people that should be involved in the decision-making process as you determine what your goals are, what your objectives are, and how you're going to reach those public relations personnel and practitioners should be a part of that as part of the management function. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, Ophiel Dukes, right? Ophiel Dukes. Um, was a, a significant um, pioneer in public relations, particularly in public service. He worked primarily in governmental, eventually in, in governmental positions, and really established and demonstrated what public relations can be in terms of, um, of th in, in public service. Also overcame lots of stereotypes regarding race. He was one of the very first um, n notable or, or well-known, I should say, practitioners of public relations of color. Uh, who was a minority, right? Because again, the bias of the of the United States at that time was that that minorities and people of color really didn't have that much off to offer in terms of professional value. Um, Ophiel Dukes really um, uh, broke that barrier in many ways. In public relations, was one of the first um, people of color to really establish themselves as someone of of the greatest value and demonstrate that that minorities. Practitioners have just as much value as, as anybody else and can do that. So overcame a lot of stereotypes regarding race, specifically as he, as he uh, pioneered that, that um, segment of public relations in public service and working through the government and established the value there. So these are some of our early modern pioneers through the early 1900s, again, up through probably about the 1960s. And then in the 1960s, what we have what I would call the modern first generation you know, now we've got those pioneers out of the way. And so starting in about the 1960s and moving forward, now we've got people who can build on that. Those pioneers have, have blazed the trail. Now these first generation of, of real practitioners building on that can really, can really benefit from the professionalization of public relations and the, and the, um, the, um, the notoriety that public relations has gained as an, as a value adding component to an organization. So uh, just a couple of people I want to talk about here just to give you some examples. But uh, the first is Harold Burson, um, established a, a public relations firm and, uh, and and really his contribution centered on globalization. It was one of the first PR firms to uh, open an office in, in Europe and really understand that there's a global market there and the differences there. He also really focused on crisis communication and reputation management and really earned a reputation there for um, really excellent work. His firm um, really worked closely with Johnson and Johnson during the Tylenol scares in the early eighties. If you recall that and you perhaps have read case studies or, or if you're old enough, you remember that I do certainly remember that where, um, someone had laced some Tylenol with cyanide and people died. And, uh, so there were a lot of, um, changes that need to be made, but the, but the first thing was that Johnson and Johnson took responsibility for it, immediately pulled things, did all these things, uh, communicated about it and really not only communicated well about that crisis, but also protected their reputation in, in the process as well. And a lot of that came from the advice they received from Harold Burson and his firm, um, who, who was their public relations partner at that time. So, um, so really established themselves as kind of the go-to people for crisis communication, reputation management, demonstrated, Again, the value that public relations practitioners can have in that respect as well and, uh, and can bring and add value to an organization through those functions. Uh, the other uh, modern kind of first generation you know, established public relations person that I want to tell you about is Daniel Edelman. Daniel Edelman, again, had his own public relations firm, uh, this in Chicago. And really was one of the first people to, to sort of look at integrating marketing and public relations. I mean, we spent a lot of time differentiating between what those things are. And they are different things. Marketing is different than public relations. But Daniel Edelman, Edelman was one of the first people to see that, you know, they are different things, but they're so closely connected and have so much value to add to one another that why can't we integrate those things? They don't have to be totally separate functions. They can work together and the, the synergy between those two things can, you know, so that the, the, uh, the, the sum can be greater than the, the total of the parts really in that respect, right? So integrating marketing and public relations and those two functions kind of together 
and, and learning about how they can work together. He also kind of really initiated what we would now call a media tour, which is now common practice. People send people out on the road and they, they, they you know, the uh, celebrities do this when they're pushing movies, for example, they're all over the place. They're doing interviews here and on podcasts there and so forth and just doing all this publicity on this media tour, right? Companies do it all the time. You have the, you know, famously the Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile, right? It's all over the place. The good your blimp is all over the place, but I mean, and so things like that would would be the derivative of a media tour, which is really the the brainchild of Daniel Edelman. People did not do that very much before. They certainly do it now, but it was an idea that he came up with, sending um, uh, people around to, on these media tours in different cities, and and had great effect. The the products benefited greatly from that. So, really, a couple of innovations there from Daniel Edelman as well. So you see the the kind of these modern first generation, what I would call modern first gen people building on what the pioneers established. Now we have, you know, they benefited from having the professionalization of public relations and, and organizations that viewed public relations as a legitimate um, value adding um, prospect for, for an organization. And they were able to then benefit from that and not have to fight that fight so much as be able to, to work on expanding that then and focusing on specific tactics and strategies and things and, and really making an impact in that way. So these are just a couple of examples of different public relations practitioners who did that over time. Um, so, you know, and that moved us into, you know, from the, from the 1960s on through kind of where we're at today. And we're still, obviously this is still an evolving process, right? This is very much an evolving process. Public relations is continuing to grow and we have things that we need to improve upon now and improve upon for the future. And that will continue the evolution. We're going to get into that in another video. What are some of the future questions, the future trends that are going to be important in public relations? But this should give you an idea of, kind of where we're coming from, at least in the most recent history. So for the last three kind of evolutions, uh, what we call evolutionary stages, maybe of public relations, where do we come from? How do we get to where we are today? with the, the mindset of public relations and where, where it sits today. So if you have questions about, about the history of public relations or about anything else related to PR, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will um, to really um, um, consider this history. It's important to know where we came from, um, both you know professionally and uh, in, in a lot of respects. And, and public relations is no different understanding how we got to this point um, can be a, a really uh, helpful piece of information as we think about what we're doing now and what we need to be doing in the future.